Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. Uh, this is our inaugural Isle of Man Sport podcast. Uh, today we are extremely lucky to have Mr. Damien Hughes, a Professor of Organisational Psychology and Change, I believe. <laughs> uh, he's going to do our sports lecture this evening and we're very lucky to get some of his time to do our first podcast. So uh, Damien, could you give us a little bit of background to yourself and uh, where you're from? And yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. I mean, you said you're lucky, I feel it's the other way around. I feel really lucky that... You've invited me over here to speak this evening and also to be on this podcast. So, first of all, thank you and thanks for anyone that's good enough to give up your time and listen. Um, so, who am I? Um, my name is Damien Hughes. Um, I do a few different jobs, to be honest. Um, um, as you mentioned, I'm a professor of organisational psychology and change. Um, so, that's my background looking very much at how teams and organisations and cultures, how they form, and then how do they cope when they come under quite intense periods of pressure. And what I do is I work as a consultant uh, across quite a wide range of organisations. I do bits in education, I do bits in the corporate world, and then I also do bits in sort of elite sport. <clears throat> so working on the coaching staff of a few teams that are interested in this topic of culture and high performance. And then the final job I do, Trev, is um, I write. So I've done a few books around these topics. Uh, so tonight at the lecture, we're going to talk about a book that I did called The Barcelona Way which looks at how FC Barcelona use culture as a competitive advantage. So I do quite a wide variety. Um, I think my background is that uh, I think if you had gone and spoke to my teachers at school, they would have described me as being uh, a decent enough lad, but um, I'd, I messed about a lot. And it was only when I left in, uh, as a grown-up that I realised that I wasn't bad in my intentions. I just got bored easily. So I like variety. I like having lots of different things on that keep me stimulated. So that's hence how I've sort of set up my life that uh, try and keep as busy as I can in areas that really intrigue me that I love mm -hmm. doing it in, so that I can um, I can keep myself constantly stimulated. Well, you've certainly got a lot, a lot of strings <laughs> yeah. to your bow and a lot of things, a lot of plates to spin, I guess as well. Yeah, not always successfully, but uh, <laughs> but. Um, I work on the other, like my mum always says to me, she says, what are you going to do when you get found out? So, uh, <laughs> so I work on the races. If you keep moving, you are the target to hit. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. I'm sure you won't get found out because uh, I, mean, I haven't listened to, to two of your books now on, on audiobook. Absolutely fantastic. And oh, thank I'd you. Rec recommend them to anyone for sure. Yeah, that's really yeah. kind. Of, I mean, it felt weird doing the audiobooks. A, a bit like, like, it's not like this where we're uh, sat chatting on the podcast. It's, you go in a studio and uh, and you're there for four days reading out a book and you've got headphones on and you've got somebody saying to you, read it again, read it again. And even though I wrote it, there's some lines that you think, I might have wrote that, but I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it like that. You know, so sometimes the words can feel a little bit incongruous and right. the Barcelona book was really interesting because there's quite a few Spanish phrases in there. And uh, the producer at one stage described what I was saying as, as manclish. He said it's Mancunian <laughs> Spanish. So uh, if nothing else, I think it's uh, worth listening to just to hear me mangle uh, some of the Spanish phrases. Uh, I mean, for me, it helped me read a school of books because I struggle to read. I start reading a book, I get really sleepy. And yeah. I'll probably read the same paragraph 10 times. <laughs> losing my spot. So it's been great to have the half hour drive to work and just stick it on the audiobook and not have to think and take it in. Uh, the challenge is then is to write notes and, and do the, the yeah, tasks. No, yeah, yeah, like no, yeah. I'm, yeah. I, like, I'm the same. I travel a lot. So I sort of, uh, I download loads of audiobooks. Um, and I, I, I find it frustrating to listen to books where you want to make notes because mm -hmm. I find it unhelpful then. So... I just try and listen to books when I'm driving that you can almost like wash over like stories or yeah. I like reading biographies. So I might have them where you can just go with the narrative rather mm. than be thinking, oh, that's an idea I could make a note of. So, yeah, I, but I agree with you that, yeah. Um, yeah, reading can be quite hard at times. So so what are your uh, top three listens on audiobook at the minute for Mr. Damien Hughes? Um, Mr. Damien Hughes. Yeah, well, I like, um, like I say, I like audiobooks. Um, and I'd probably say I'm... I'd, I, I like podcasts as well, especially for shorter journeys. Mm -hmm. So the podcasts I like listening to, 
beyond yours that I'm now going to subscribe to <laughs> is uh, I like the Desert Island Disc ones. Right. Because I love the... Radio uh, 4, is it? Yeah, yeah it's Radio yeah. 4, but obviously it's been going for like 75 years, so you'll hear people that you might not know, but I've got amazing stories to tell, and then I just love that narrative of choosing seven songs that define your life in some way, and the way the interviewers sort of weave it in. Mm-hmm. I always find that's lovely. But for audio books, I like... Uh, like I say, I like biographies, so um, I like them where, um, like, there's a, there's a writer called, um, I'm going to think of his name in a minute, uh, I think he's called Max Hastings, um, and he writes a lot of sort of historical facts, so he did one called Agent Zigzag, where he goes through the archives, so when, like, the 50-year uh, rule is up or whatever it is, where you can reveal oh, so some of the official yeah. secrets. Yeah. So at the minute he's doing a lot like around World War Two of just some amazing stories from the official secrets acts. So the one I read recently was uh, um, called Agent Zigzag. So it's a guy that basically double crossed the Germans for the British Army, and it's his story which is just intriguing. It's yeah. just absolutely mind blowing what was going on. So uh, yeah, I like anything like that that I can wash over while you're driving. Super. Okay, so we've got a. Sport Alaman Sport Coaches Forum on Facebook, yeah. and I put to the group, "What questions would you like to give Damien on, yeah. his, on, on his on his visit to the island?" So I've got some of them here. Uh, I'm going to fire some of them at you, at you if you don't mind. Yeah, brilliant. Let's uh, go for it. Our first one is from Michael Hazlitt. Michael has been a community coach at Alaman Sport in the Sport Development Unit, and he's also branched out now privately he's doing uh, coaching uh, in his active souls business which is all around uh, using kids games as a way of engaging adults in fun fitness oh, session brilliant. Oh, so, okay. you know he's really taken something quite innovative there and you know I, I think he's doing quite well and good luck to him because yeah, yeah. it's a fantastic concept Adults doing British Bulldog. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, really. There's a few that you could settle a few scores like that, couldn't you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, That's uh, a great idea. I must get myself a long time ago and uh, hopefully not pull a hammy when someone hits me a bit hard on Bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> Clubs line, Joe. Oh, yeah. So Michael's question was, uh, he would, not a direct question, but would love to know Damien's thoughts on the value of community in relation to its role in increasing engagement, motivation and longevity in athletes, players and participants. Oh, right. Well, OK. Well, thanks for the question, Michael. I appreciate you asking it. Um, my, um, I mean, one bit I didn't explain when we were chatting at the start was that um, I, so I grew up in a boxing gym, so in uh, Manchester, um, before I was born, um, my dad had set up a boxing gym uh, in the inner city, uh, which is where we come from. And um, it's classed as Europe's third poorest district. And the reason I tell you this bit of the background is because it links to Michael's point that it became almost like a, a beacon within the community. So it was a poor, deprived area. Um, but the boxing gym became a central part of it. Now, there was a number... Well, that had uh, five lads from the local community that went on to become um, champions at an elite level, whether it was world or Olympic titles that they won. Uh, but equally, the impact he had on thousands of people from that community that never went on to become boxers, but just went on to become decent members mm-hmm. of the community uh, is huge. So last year we had a really nice, um, my dad's quite poorly now, but uh, Manchester Council named a road after him in Manchester. Fantastic. In, um, in the area where he grew up and where the impact was. And what was nice was, there was uh, we had um, like 6,000 people sign a petition for it. And on the day they unveiled the road, we had a few hundred people turn up. And a, a large amount of them were people from that community who, went, who came to speak about the lessons they'd learned within that gym. Mm-hmm and how it had served them well in their own lives. You know, some had gone on to be incredibly successful in business, some had been gone and been successful in uh, in medicine and things like that. But a lot of them were just people that had been raised families and were just really decent members of their own community. So I don't underestimate the value that places this, like this can have. So the question is, well, what was it doing? And the first thing was, like, just give you a really simple example that, my dad wouldn't allow people to use bad language when they came in the club. 
Now, that might sound like a gimmick or something that sounds a bit incongruous, but his point was, if you, if you lack the discipline to think of something else to say other than just effing and blinding, that lack of discipline might cost you when you're in the boxing ring. So not learning not to swear when it's your first instinct was a way of, of starting to develop discipline. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So, so he linked it to the sport that we're doing, but the idea was, as a kid, if you, if you go and apply for a job and your first instinct is to be effing and blinding, the reality is the world probably closes its doors on you and you don't even know that's the reason. So he was teaching them just values of decency, humility, coming in and working hard, being disciplined at what you do. All stuff that would serve you well in anything that yeah. you do. But for some of these kids and the environment that they were growing up in, they weren't seeing that and it was the nearest place that would welcome them in, that they could come and experience what it was like to be included within a community that had those values right at the very heart of it. So I don't know if that answers Michael's point, but the point is, so I do, I, I'm a huge advocate of the power um, of sport and the clubs that it sounds like Michael's mm-hmm. doing with you saying with these um, games that he's playing and the business he's setting up, the impact that can have on just bringing people into a community where sport and inclusiveness and fun and keeping fit are all valued rather than anything to be feared. Uh, is huge, it's, it, both on the island and anywhere else that you would choose to go. Fantastic, that's a great insight and quite an honour for your dad to have a, a road named after him as well. Obviously, the, he's, he's had a massive impact on a lot of people's lives, so to feel so strongly to, to do that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's really, it, it, it was a real um, tribute. So, uh, so his own story is interesting um, that he... he that he was born in sort of post-war Manchester in a, in a very Catholic um, neighbourhood. But he was born out of wedlock, uh, was a wedlock and never knew his dad. Now, that might be, that's obviously more accepted these days, but in that era, that was a real stigma. Right. So um, he grew up almost never knowing, well, he, he did never know who his dad was. And he went into boxing at a young age because he didn't have a father figure or anyone looking out for him. He was quite badly abused in the sport. Now, not sexually abused, but where, you know what boxing's like, people will hurt you. Mm-hmm. And if there's nobody looking out for you, you can often be too brave for yeah. your own good. So he experienced like the rotten end of the sport for a long time. And it was only when he was in his mid-twenties, it was almost like a way, I think, psychologically, of writing the wrongs that had done to him. So he became a father figure for children that maybe mm-hmm. didn't have it as well. So he was very much fulfilling that role in the community so he I remember the Daily Mirror did a piece on him calling him the Pied Piper of Collyhurst which is the area of Manchester mm-hmm. where he's from where he became sort of a father figure to two kids in the community that maybe were from disadvantaged backgrounds and um, yeah like I like it because I show it to my children and one we like laughing at the fact that they can put the granddad's name in the sat nav and he turns up <laughs> but more significantly I try and get them to recognise that just being kind being decent being mm. respectful to other people are values that I've seen it in first hand that even in areas where you wouldn't necessarily associate those values the impact of them yeah. to hu- on a human level is pretty significant that's fantastic as well the fact that one person can have such an impact as well on, on, on so many people just is amazing I think a lot of people tend to think that you as an individual or I as an individual would, would struggle to, to to be able to have such a you know a positive effect on on such a wide circle of people yeah but I, I, I think the lesson that I take from that though Trevor I think it's a really good point that you're making I think I don't think he ever set out to try and impact on a mm. wide group of people I think he just set out to impact on his small bit of the world do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He wanted to. He was passionate about boxing. Um, he used to say to any of the box. So he was really strict about who he would allow to box, and that wasn't being snobbish. But he used to say, "It's not a sport you play. It's a sport you do. So you can mm-hmm. get hurt at it." And he used to say, "If you if if you've got another talent, go and do that talent rather than box." And but then those that would stay with him through that, yeah. he used to say to them, "My my job is to get you out of this career." 
that he used to say, so go and look in the mirror and have a look at your face, because I want your face to look the same mm. when you finish as what it does when you start, but I want you to have a few quid to show for what you've done. Yeah. So he used to get great pleasure out of uh, lads that he'd bought, lads that boxed for him, being able to buy their own homes or mm-hmm. be able to look after their mum and dads, as much as winning world titles oh, was yeah. thing. It was almost mm-hmm. about that these lads could go and live a full life without getting hurt. So defence was a big part of his, of his coaching. Fantastic. Now that's a great question from Michael. Thank you for that. We'll we'll move on to our next one, which is from Gareth Hinge. Gareth's a, a senior coach at our, our local rugby club up in Ramsey. And his question is, I'd be interested on Damien's thoughts on keeping large squads together and everyone buying into the team culture, even though some players may not get a starting position or even meet the match day squad on a regular basis. Well, that's a good question. So, well, again, thanks, Gareth. Thanks for asking it. Um, it's a brilliant question. That I, I heard Gareth Southgate talk about this last year when he was saying that how he measures the culture with the England squad is he looks at um, how engaged. He said he considers his most important player in the squad to be the third choice goalkeeper, because he said barring disasters, that that's the position where you know you're definitely not going to play. So he always uses them as his barometer. If they're engaged, they're happy, and they're right. they're still coming along. Nobody else has got any excuses not to be. So that might be an angle that Gareth wants to think about in terms of you have a look at rather than see these as being peripheral members of your squad because they're not playing or maybe the least talented, these become your most important because they're your canary in the mine. That if they're not buying into the practices, mm. what there's questions of what's happening further up. So culturally, these people become really significant. You know, there's another argument that says your culture is only as strong as your weakest members. And if these are perceived, and I use that term loosely, but if these are perceived as your weakest members because they're not the best players, they're not the guys going to be in there. Your culture depends on them more than your best players doing it because it's easy to be civil and polite and decent and respectful when everything's going your way. The question is, can you still behave like that when it's not going your way? So I wouldn't underestimate the importance of these characters and making sure that they're bought into it. How you go about it, well, that's a huge question in its own right and... I wouldn't claim to know um, the context of what Gareth's talking about. I know mm-hmm. you mentioned in terms of uh, running a rugby club. So I don't know how much they've done of this, but I think when you're really clear about the behaviours that define your culture, you don't have more than three, you don't need more than three, but three really clear behaviours of this is the way we operate around here. That way it gives everyone a sense. It removes ambiguity of how do I handle not mm-hmm. playing, how do I handle success how to handle failure it removes that ambiguity and gives people a clear sense of this is the way that we operate here and then to go back to the point these players that maybe not in the squad they're a sign of how deeply embedded your culture is yeah if they're displaying those key behaviors that you're yeah. setting out to achieve excellent yeah it's a brilliant question though so thank you gareth yeah we might as well come straight on to gareth's second question go on. <laughs> while we're on gareth which would be uh what Damien's thoughts on athlete coach relationships and do we all know <laughs> do we all all now have to hug our players like Klopp, Greg Popovich, <laughs> uh, the great NBA coach of all time, claimed his relationships with players helped him when it came to often brutal feedback sessions. Can this work at an amateur level? Wow, again, it's a, it's another brilliant question. Um and I get Gareth's point there about it's easy to see the likes of Klopp being a bully and, and giving everyone a big cuddle and Popovich as well. The first thing I'd say is that don't copy anyone because then it just becomes a gimmick. And I think I've, I've got a real um, um, aversion to gimmickry in any organisations. Like we were talking earlier, weren't we, off air, where I was saying I, I see that a lot of people try and copy the All Blacks. You know, one of the things that the All Blacks talk about is they sweep the sheds. So it's the idea they tidy the dressing room yeah. up after their game. And I go into so many teams where they go, oh, we sweep the sheds. And you say, why? And they go, because New Zealand do. And you go, I know why New Zealand do. Why do you do it? And they go, because New Zealand do. You go, well, that's not a culture. You're just copying. You're just coming up with a gimmick. New Zealand do it because it's about humility and not getting above yourself and thinking you're really important. But if you're only doing it because New Zealand do it, 
you're missing the cultural point which is reinforcing how everybody else has to behave and it might not be relevant for for your culture mm. to sweep the sheds this is what I mean so just because Klopp does it you know I there's an authenticity to Klopp that I think is what we what the point to recognise not what he does it's that I imagine he's like that in when he's not on the touchline yeah. every day he's a bully and, and effusive and really enthusiastic so people were warm to that because he's behaving in a consistent manner if he was only doing it because the cameras were there or because things were going well I guarantee those players would see straight through it as just a gimmick or he was doing it because it worked well for him so the first point I say is no you don't have to copy Jurgen Klopp and do that but what I would say is the more important point that Gallus making there is you do need to have a relationship with your players that are based on integrity so you behave in a way yeah. that you would do all the time so you treat people decently um, so the point about the Greg Popovich bit about being able to give feedback uh, brutal feedback and you can get away with it because it's um, you have strength relationships I like the idea of giving feedback I don't necessarily like the idea of it having to be brutal mm-hmm. I think you can give feedback um, based on behaviours without having to cross the line of making it personal yeah. about the individual you know say that to a lot of clubs that I work with criticise the behaviour not the individual if that's the way you want to do it if you so I see it sometimes when you get players go oh, he's a right dickhead him and you go that's not feedback you're making a personal attack on him tell me the behaviours that he does that make you think he's a dickhead and then you can feedback because he can stop the behaviours but he can't stop who he is you know so yeah and you can do that. So the relationship that Popovich speaks about is built on respect, courtesy, shared understanding, common ground. Mm. That when he criticises, I bet his feedback is based on behaviours, not on the person. They know he's not attacking them. He's, a, he's addressing yeah. dysfunctional behaviours that they're engaging in. I suppose something we, we talked about earlier today was that psychological safety as well. I, mean, I think as a coach, if you... Yeah. If you're trying to create that environment where your players do feel psychologically safe, where they can be uh, open and honest with you, and perhaps those feedback sessions are, are going to be f- far easier to manage. And, and 100%. So it's a really good point, and as you say, we were speaking about it this afternoon, where psychological safety is one of these. It's, it's such a quiet quality that you can miss it if you're not looking for it. And it's the idea that if you're a coach and and... And Gareth's question there is about can you do this at amateur level? This is what well, we're not talking about. Um, so we talk about people rather than performers. So it doesn't matter what level mm-hmm. it is. But if you're a coach and you want to know how psychologically safe people feel, when you're doing your team sessions or your or your meetings or whatever it is, have a look at how many questions people are asking you. Have a look at how many people are speaking up and being listened to. And because what you often find is that when people don't feel so when somebody do so when somebody put asks a question and says how would I handle this chat what they're doing under the surface and this is the quiet quality of it the first thing they're doing if they ask you a question they feel safe enough that you're not going to take the piss out of them or you're not going to laugh at them or you're not going to make them feel stupid that they didn't know the answer so there's a safety there in admitting I don't know The second thing they're doing is they're giving you the opportunity to build trust between them. So if I say to you, I don't understand how to do this, Joe, and you say, okay, that's fine, let's work on this together. You're just showing through your behaviours that I can trust you, that you're not going to make me feel foolish, and you're going to work with me to help me get the answer I want. Now, if either of those two things are not there, I'm not asking you questions. And if I'm not asking you questions, I'm not letting you know what I don't understand. So your opportunity to coach me gets diminished massively because you've uh, undermined the circumstances in which learning has to happen. So it's a brilliant question that Gareth's asking. So I'll answer it in two parts. Don't copy anybody, be authentic to yourself. But in terms of delivering feedback to people, not players, to people, you need to create psychological safety and trust. And that way, you can have honest conversations about behaviours that lead to improved performance. 
Fantastic. That's some great great advice there. Some real simple, easy tips that you can <laughs> put into action yeah. as well. Uh, so let's move on. So we've got uh, another question from Andy Gosnell. Uh, Gozzi, as he's affectionately known, is a football <laughs> coach. And he's also a community coach in primary schools as well. And his question is, relate to Gareth's first question on large squads and everyone buying into the team culture, which Gareth asked. And on that question, he'd be interested to know how creating a culture works in grassroots clubs with volunteer coaches working with different age groups and teams and how to overcome potential barriers. If that isn't articulated very well, then if you could put it... Uh, <laughs> oh, that's me just yeah. reading it out. So, yeah, so yeah, basically... No, I think it is. I think he has articulated it yeah. really well. So thank you, Andrew. Um, the stuff around grassroots level, that some of this stuff that... We, that we might be talking about there we, that we, we're we using professional examples of guys that have paid money to go and do this so the demands change this a little bit more than if you're at grassroots level but there are certain principles that can still be, be applied and I'll give you an example that when I speak to grassroots coaches and often these are really well intentioned and they're often parents that are doing it to ensure that their children can play so all of that has to be acknowledged that these are people that are not claiming professionalism, but they come in with really great um, reasons to do it. But that doesn't stop us falling into some really simple traps. So the first one is when you say to play, if you ask a parent or a coach, what's the first question you ask your child when they come off a field of a weekend? Now there's an awful lot of coaches, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of coaches will often say to me, well, how did you get on? Did you win? What score was it? And my challenge is, that shouldn't be your first question. It's not that you shouldn't ask it, but you shouldn't ask it first. It's the order of it. Because by definition, most weekends, half the kids that walk off that field will have lost. So if you only value winning, what about the kids that don't win? Is, are you suggesting that the experience they've just had isn't as valid? So... There's three better questions I'd often think about as if I was a parent or a coach asking. The first one is, did you enjoy yourself? Because if the answer to that is yes, there's a good chance they'll come back next week. So you've got that engagement. Second question is, what did you learn? So you know that there's, there's an education process happening, that they're mm -hmm. getting better, they're applying the lessons in really practical terms. The third question is, how were you a good teammate? How did you contribute to the team? How did you help the team? Something like that. So you know that socially, mm -hmm. they're contributing to the wider group. And then the fourth question might be, and how did you get on? Because it, at grassroots levels, what you're doing is you're still trying to coach and where, you put, where your questions will betray what you value is most mm -hmm. important. So how, half the kids won't win a game and if, you're only, if your first or only question is, how did you get on? You risk losing some really valuable coaching opportunities there. So some of this stuff is relatively simple. It's just the language and where we put our focus and attention. And when we step away from it, like I'm sure Andrew would recognise, it's all common sense. There's nothing that mm -hmm. clever about it. But when we're caught up in the emotion of it or we're busy, we can often fall into... E easier questions that actually don't help the culture we're mm -hmm. trying to develop uh, going back almost to, to the earlier session about the was it the red thinking and the blue thinking yeah sort yeah. of going to the questions that could come naturally easy to you so rather than trying to think of the questions that might dig out some of the deeper learning that they might have got from an experience yeah so if you come out to a kid like i so i've got a son he's nine and my daughter's six and uh, and I learned this when my son first went to school, and I don't know if you've got it with Felix, when like, you pick her up at school and you go, how was your day? And they go, it's all right. And you go, what did you do today? Nothing. And they go, can't remember. And I went and picked my son, George, up every day for about three weeks when he first started school, and we had the same conversation on the way back. And it dawned on me one day, he's giving me feedback, he doesn't want to answer the questions I'm asking. So you can either get frustrated yeah. or ask a different question. So now when I pick him up, I'll say, what's the daftest thing anyone said to you today? What's the funniest thing that happened in school? Who made you laugh the most? And he always has an answer to that because he wants to ask a different question. So like I say, you're right, sometimes our instinct is we do default questions. Mm -hmm. And if you stop and think about it, 
there's more valuable questions that get you get you the information you want but engage them at a different level and that's what we're suggesting here for grassroots coaches just the questions you ask will often betray where your priorities lie excellent now some good good hints there um, i thought that chat with felix definitely used to be always what how was your day and i sort of now moved it along into <laughs> what was your best bit yeah brilliant yeah. yeah what was your best bit of school and she usually you can see the cogs turn and she'll she'll come up with something yeah yeah, yeah. brilliant yeah so I'll take a few of those questions when I get home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up, so Paul Jones, uh, our national team coach uh, for football, and Paul is also uh, one of the great minds behind the Ironman Sport uh, Sports Aid Academy. Uh, Paul's question, thinking similar to Andrew, uh, he had had, looking at the creation of cultures in semi-pro or amateur environments that people have only come to, come together a couple of times a week if that what would you advise as key steps to building a great and sustainable cultural environment where people are coming together less yeah frequently? okay well thanks Paul and mm. I mean it's been a real treat to meet Paul today as well um, and hear a bit of the context on this so it's nice to have the chance to to think about these questions um, I actually think the cultural thing becomes even more important at this sort of amateur level because if you think of amateur, you're doing it because you, the etymology of the word is you're doing something you love. Amateur mm -hmm. translates as you're doing something that you love. So nobody wants to come somewhere and not enjoy it. So putting your focus on the softer skills and culture often gets badged as a soft skill as opposed to the hard skills of just running them hard and doing practice. I'm not. They're both equally important. It's not an either or, it's a both and. Mm -hmm. So I think um, investing time in doing this, of identifying this concept of trademark behaviours, what are the behaviours that we're going to define ourselves when we're at our very best, and having a look at how they can be then applied across every setting. So if you're going to talk about, um, if you're going to demand that players come along to training and their presence at training is going to determine if they're going to be part of it, you need to tell people that up front. You know, or you're going to uh, have players in terms of we encourage each other, we don't start getting on each other's back when we're in adversity. You need to communicate that up front. And then that way, when those behaviours are not being displayed, you can address the behaviour, not the person behind it, right. because you've agreed them. What I see, um, and I see this in professional clubs as well as uh, semi-pro or amateur clubs is, they either, the two mistakes they make with this is, they either do this in pre-season and then never revisit it, or they do it when they're in a crisis, when they start thinking about taking it seriously. What I would say is that this needs to be done, kicked off as soon as possible, but it needs to be revisited on a regular basis. Don't underestimate the value of not sending the players running around the field, but keeping them in a dressing room and talking about those behaviours. You know, we use this phrase this afternoon, get into the habit of starting catching pe people in and catching them out. Mm -hmm. So have a session where you give feedback on after a game. What did I like about you? Why did I value you as a teammate? Mm -hmm. And start just giving each other positive feedback because those positive strokes are just as valuable as doing a review of why yeah. we didn't win and what were the reasons behind it. So it needs to be something that you kick off as soon as possible, but you just keep it ticking over and make sure that yeah. it's a it's a constant focus rather than just an every now and again focus. Sort of reminds me of an approach I took. I coach in the Sports Institute as a S and C coach. Yeah. I've been working with the uh, development players. Uh, so the, the, we've got a link with Sales Sharks, and I thought I'd try something different. Yeah. So we got them involved at the start of the the, the block of sessions where. I gave them all their screening tests so they could look at their strengths and weaknesses as physical ones and the you know, yeah, rest yeah. of it. And they had to sort of draw out where they felt their strengths were and where they wanted to improve. And then from that, look at, well, how are you going to do that in the session? Uh, and then they basically got involved in developing their own program. But we also did that with the sort of values, but we did we kind of took the core values from the English RFU, which are trace, right. teamwork, respect, enjoyment, and discipline. Uh, so they, they were sort of bought into the process from the start. Uh, then at the end of each session, they would rate each other with like a peer review. Oh, right, uh, brilliant. On how hard they felt they'd worked in the session or they might have been given a target of one of the 
core values that they were yeah, yeah. You know, and rated themselves on on their team with respect, enjoyment, and discipline. Oh, phenomenal! And it was it was quite good because they were it wasn't coming from me; it was coming from them, and they didn't want to give their mate an easy ride either, you know, because they wanted to make sure they were uh, help br bring some of them on task who perhaps weren't necessarily stepping up to the mark. So the next week, you'd notice a difference in. That's how they reacted. So that. quite, it, was, it was quite powerful. Well, don't underestimate yeah. that power of peer feedback is mm. one of those things that... It's, so if you're shouting at them, it's an autocracy. Cause they, so what you do is they wait till you're not looking and dysfunctional behaviours go underground. When it's your mate that mm. sees it, it's harder to hide. And the power of that peer feedback mm. is huge in terms of for any culture, whether this is amateur or professional, you don't want to let your mates down. Absolutely. You know, I remember hearing Stuart Lancaster talk about this years ago, and again, this might fit into Paul's idea that <clears throat> he did it with the England rugby union team when he got them together and he got them did an exercise where he said, "What's the best team you've ever uh, been a part of?" Um, in terms of the team that you enjoyed most, and what his answer was that virtually all the England squad spoke about their amateur team or their school team. So then he went and scratched a bit deeper and said, why? And there was two answers that emerged from uh, the, his review. One was they said, we played without any real pressure. So we were playing for the fun of it, the mm -hmm. amateur ethos. And the second one was playing with my mates and I'd dig a bit deeper to help my mates and I knew they'd cover yeah. my back and I'd cover theirs. Now there's something really powerful there that if you can tap into that, like Paul's question of, we're doing this because we love doing it. So what do we love about it? One, we're playing because it's fun. So let's make it enjoyable. But secondly, let's look out for each other. Let's have each other's mm -hmm. backs. Let's not just say that. Let's practice it and let's get into this habit of giving each other feedback on why we value each other, what you bring to this dressing room that makes me glad you're a teammate mm -hmm. of mine. There's something very, very strong about that. Absolutely. No, that's awesome. So we'll have a look at some of the other questions. I'm conscious of time as well. Uh, so... Paul sent a few in. <laughs> we'll go on to Paul's next question oh. on something else, which, which is a good Paul. one to pick from Paul here. Uh, have you got any cultural change do's and don'ts? Is it easier to change between certain types than others? So I suppose looking at the cultures you talked about in yeah, the most yeah, long way. And how long might it realistically take to change a culture in different environments, whether it's full-time, part-time, amateur? Can it be fast-tracked? If so, what might be the key components, or is it just a case of time, consistency, and patience? Well, right, okay. So there's a few really, really sort of incisive yeah. questions there. So first one I'd say is um, do's and don'ts. Don't do it if it's a gimmick. Uh, don't do it if you're, just, if you're doing it because you're simply ticking a box. And I mean that really, like really respectfully of if you're doing it because you think we've got a bit of time in pre-season or doing it because I've heard people talk about culture, you're honestly better off not bothering doing it because um, it'll just create cynicism that when somebody does come along with the time and inclination, you just make the task harder for, mm -hmm. for them. So I'd say don't do it for those reasons. Do do it if you value the idea, if you want culture to be a competitive advantage. Because that idea, the Stuart Lancaster example, that cohesion that follows a high-performing culture, one makes the, whatever you're doing enjoyable, but secondly, it will improve your performance from wherever you start from. Um, in terms of the different types of culture, um, again, we'll speak about this at the, uh, the lecture tonight, but we'll speak about there's five different types of culture, and I think this is what Paul's alluding to. So I'll just talk about it very briefly. Mm -hmm. The first type of culture you get is a star culture, where you just get the best players, throw them all together in a room, give them the best facilities, and just hope they deliver spectacular results. The second type of culture is an autocracy, where it's just one or two people shouting the odds, and it's their way or the highway. The third type of culture is often called a bureaucracy, and this is where it's all about policies and procedures, and you've got committees making decisions. The fourth one is an engineering culture where you just get technically brilliant people so you recruit them for their technical expertise. But the fifth type of culture is what was referred to as a commitment culture. And a commitment culture is one where you're really clear about the behaviours and the values and the purpose of why you're doing it. Now, just the research on this topic says that it's the fifth culture, the commitment culture, that gives you the best 
long-term chance of success. So one study suggested that a commitment culture is about 22% more successful than those other four types I gave you. That, and that's not to say they can't be successful. They can, and there's lots of evidence of it, but they just don't give you the, the guarantee or the sustainability. Commitment cultures do that. So that's one that any club can do, or any team, whether you're talking about an amateur team, a high-level professional team. It's about being really clear about the behaviours, the behavioural rules of the game, these are the behaviours that define our culture. Now, again, this is worth just giving, going back to the question of uh, do's and don'ts. The mistake here that I see a lot of organisations do is they talk about values and not behaviours. Now, this is, your behaviours should represent your values in action. But if you just talk about values, values is an abstract term. It doesn't mean a great deal on its own. A behaviour is something very evident. The second mistake that you see made is them when if teams take do this they come up with a shopping list of all the nice things that'd be nice to do in your organization it's nice to be nice should be professional we should have high energy they, they come up with a big long shopping list commitment cultures don't have more than three they have three behaviors they're easy to remember and they're easy to navigate by so we'll talk about barcelona tonight but the three that barcelona had when they set off on this was humility hard work and you put the team first. So what they were saying is, when in any situation you're in, that's almost the mental inventory, the checklist you need to go down. Am I behaving arrogantly or am I demonstrating humility here? Am I working hard or am I coasting? And am I putting my interest above the team's interest? So they give you a mental checklist. That, yeah. So there's a lovely phrase that a director of football that sit, he's now at Manchester City, but he was at Barcelona called Cheeky Bagheerastain mm-hmm. says, he says, your talent just merely gets you into the dressing room. Your behaviour decides if we'll keep you in that room. So what you're establishing is, once we've established that you can do the job, it's how you behave mm-hmm. that defines the culture. The final question that Paul the asked was about, uh, how long does it take? Depends. There's no definitive answer to this, I'd say. that uh, There's no silver bullet. The easiest way is, think of it like an ecosystem that there's lots of threads that need to be consistently applied. Now, like an ecosystem, you can take a thread out and it weakens the system. It doesn't kill it, but it'll just make Mm -hmm. it a bit weaker. Similarly, you can add a thread in and it won't make the system, it'll just strengthen it. So there's a whole series of initiatives that need to be done and that's part of what uh, you were kind enough to invite me for the lecture tonight to talk about these different threads and what that looks like and how they need to be constantly applied and monitored and measured. Excellent. Now, some uh, really good questions from everyone there. I'm really oh, pleased we've got some. Uh, some it's some really touching good... that people have taken the trouble to think about such incisive questions. And, you know, from your point of view, that you've got that quality of thinking here on the island yeah. that people that care that much to want to submit them. And I think that's a sign of a really healthy sporting culture mm-hmm. that you obviously do have here. I mean, uh, speaking from, I suppose, what I see in my experiences in sport in Ireland, man, you know, we're immensely lucky to have people like these guys who put these questions in, yeah. and people who are turning out week in, week out to help coach sessions, no matter what the age group, no matter what the level. Yeah, yeah, Everyone's there's really, a, really there's massively... something really significant about that, and you know, if anyone, if anyone's got this far in the podcast and listening, yeah. I mean, that again, that's really kind that people are prepared to give up their time. That tells you something about how passionate they obviously are to to make a difference absolutely no so thank you very much to everyone for for, for some brilliant questions we're gonna have to close it up there because uh we don't want you guys getting too bored (laughs) (laughs) which i'm sure you're not and we've got to crack on and get uh, prepared for tonight's lecture so thank you very much for taking the time to to come listen to the first alaman sport podcast guys and thank you to damien for for your time in, in in doing this and answering these questions so no it, 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 i mean it's a real pleasure trevor and, and again i'd say this because if it helps with the podcast or any of your listeners if you want to get in touch um i'm happy my support doesn't just extend to listening to this if people wanted to have questions that occur to them on the back of it and want to drop us a line uh they're more than welcome to like twitter is probably the easiest way mm. so i'm a, i'm at liquid thinker on there and I normally get the messages through and I'll respond and yeah. drop a line and get in touch with people. But, you know, I know anyone's listening wants to make a difference. And if I can help you make a difference, 
it'd be a real treat to do so. Brilliant. Damien, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you.